Good afternoon. Uh, am I audible? Okay. Uh, so, what did we discuss in our last lecture? So, we discussed an algorithm called Thomson sampling, right? So, what was the main idea in Thomson sampling? So, in the uh, yeah, for example, in ETC algorithm, we were maintaining point estimates where we were just uh, calculating the sample average of the rewards and treating that sample average as an estimate for our true mean. Then we, in the UCP algorithm, instead of just relying on the sample average, we were also looking at some deviation from the sample average, right? Instead of looking at um, mu bar alone, we were looking at mu bar plus some epsilon. Right. If we assume that uh, with high probability, we have well, used uh, epsilon such that with high probability, mu bar lies between mu bar mu minus epsilon to mu plus epsilon. Then, then in the Thomson sampling, what did we do? We maintained some belief about what our true mean is. So we were maintaining a distribution on what our true mean could be. And when initially, when we do not know anything, we assume that the true mean can be anything in between 0 and 1 uniformly, right? Then, as we get some samples from each arm, we update the distribution about our true mean. We update our belief about the true mean. So, to do that, for the case of Bernoulli rewards, where the reward can either be 0 or 1, what prior did we take? We took a prior distribution called beta distribution, right? How many parameters does beta distribution have? Two parameters, right? Alpha. So th we started with uh, this kind of a prayer for each uh, uh, arm. Like if you don't know anything, you can take alpha not equal to beta not equal to one. If you know something, you can take some other alpha betas. Then after every uh, sample from that arm, so we have some distribution for each arm. What did we do? We just sampled some theta hat from each of the arms. Whichever arm had the highest theta hat, which is sampled from the corresponding beta distribution, we played that arm, right? So for every arm, we will sample uh, a theta hat from its uh, corresponding beta distribution. Whichever arm has the highest theta in that uh, time, we will just play that arm. After playing that arm, what did we do? We update our beta distribution corresponding to the term. How did we update? Like alpha nu will be alpha old plus uh, indicator the reward equal to 1. If we had got a uh, 0 reward, what would you have done? If we had got a success, we would have updated our alpha. If we had got a failure, would have updated our beta. So that is how we did Thomson sampling, right?
so that is about uh, thomson sampling mm, today's lecture what we'll see is a set of algorithms called policy gradient methods and this time permits i'll try to quickly tell what are called contextual bandits okay <clears throat> so till now uh, whatever we have done uh, we have uh, assumed that there are some finite number of arms right so like uh, in any algorithm whatever we have seen till now roughly we were sampling at least in the ucb also we sampled each arm once and then we did something initially we sampled every arm once so let's say instead of having a finite number of arms let's say you have uh, infinite number of arms let's say our arm can be any number between 0 and 1 it's let's say you have a continuous set of arms right so maybe there is a lottery mission where you have to just enter some number based on what number you enter you will get some reward right let's say you can enter any real number between 0 and 1 in the mission right so your arm will be some number between 0 and 1 you will get some reward for pressing that particular number so then in such a case how, how should we do things right uh, ucb will say play each arm once we cannot do that right there are infinite numbers between 0 and 1 so every number is like an arm for us right so if you have some continuous uh, set of arms or like that is one uh, motivation for policy gradient algorithm this can handle even uh, arms uh, with uh, fine infinite number of arms like you have a continuous set of arms and in such cases you can use policy gradient algorithm and also uh, in some cases, it might not be possible to find the true mean of every arm, right? So if you have a lot of arms, it might not be possible to find what is the estimate of true mean for every arm. So in, in such a case, instead of uh, trying to understand what is the true mean of every arm, you just directly try to learn a policy. What is a good policy? You don't first estimate the true means and then based on that, you don't learn the policy. So you directly learn a policy. Like, what should I do in this round? You just try to model that directly instead of trying to understand first what is the value for each arm, what is the estimate of each arm, and then decide what to do. You try to model uh, directly as to what you want to do. You try to model the policy itself directly. Right? Uh, so these are some uh, motivations for looking at the policy gradient algorithm. So just to, uh, like these are, uh, this, this kind of a concept we'll see uh, even in the full RL setting, not just in the bandit setting. So it's good uh, if you understand this clearly and if you have any doubts, please feel free to stop me in between as well. And so if it was some uh, value-based method, there are roughly two classes of RL algorithms at a very high level. Uh, they are called policy based algorithms and value based algorithms. So, value based algorithm means you try to learn what is the estimates of uh, rewards, like what is the average reward that you get. That's what is referred as value of a particular action. Like, what is the value that we get for playing an action, the reward, right? So, if you try to first estimate what is the value for every action, and then once you get some estimates of the actions, based on that, you decide what to do. That's called value-based method, okay? There is called something called policy-based method where you directly try to learn what to do without having an intermediate step of estimating what is the reward for each arm separately. In, implicitly, you'll do something. At, of course, you, if you don't understand which, reward, which arms are good, you will not be able to get a good policy. But instead of looking at it as an intermediate step where you first learn which arm has which value, and then based on that, you decide your policy. Instead of that, what we'll, direct, we'll try to directly learn what is called a good policy. How do we define a good policy, etc. We'll try to see now, okay? No, it doesn't mean that there is no exploration. All that I'm saying is you won't try to explicitly learn what is the value for each arm. You'll try, directly try to learn what policy, what arm should I play. 
Okay. Yeah, even that is trying to estimate the distribution of what your true mean is, right? So all the algorithms that you have seen till now are value based, where we are trying to explicitly understand what is the true mean of a every arm. Okay. So there are roughly uh, two kinds of RL algorithms. This will directly try to learn a good policy without explicitly estimating the values of each arm. Okay. So, like the motivation for policy gradient descent is the following. Yeah, this is one uh, for one motivation. There, there will be a couple of other motivations which we'll see maybe when we are dealing with policy gradient in the full RL setting. Okay, so just to give you a feel of what do we mean by a policy. So one more uh, motivation for policy gradient is uh, in right now in our current setting, uh, if you want a policy, like what, uh, what, like there could be a deterministic policy which is optimal, right? For example, whatever is the best term, if you somehow find what is the best term, playing the term in every time slot is the best policy, right? Somehow you find which is the arm with the highest true mean. And after that, in every time slot, you just play the term. Like it's it can be a deterministic policy. If you can correctly estimate what is the true value of each arm, then you have to just play a deterministic policy, which is to play the arm with the highest true mean. So in when we go to the full RL setting, we'll see that uh, it under some uh, prop, in some uh, scenarios, there might not exist a deterministic policy, which is the best, like the best policy need not be a deterministic policy. In the sense that, let's say there are a lot of actions, Playing one particular action is not going to be the best policy. Maybe playing arm A1 with half, probability half and playing arm A2 with probability half might be the best policy. Might turn out to be a better policy than just playing one of them all the time. Okay. So the best policy could be a stochastic policy in some scenarios. You might not be able to appreciate this right now because our problem settings are such that Mm, the best policy will look like a deterministic policy. If you uh, assume that you know the true means of all the arms, the best policy will look like uh, it's a deterministic. There will always exist a best policy which is deterministic. But uh, in the full RL setting, even if you assume that we know all the true means of all the actions, we will encounter a scenario where you might still uh, not have a deterministic policy which we can call as the best policy. You might have to play. A randomized policy. For example, in games like rock, paper, scissors, there will not be a deterministic policy which is optimal, right? So it might be good to have uh, some randomization in our actions. Otherwise, our opponent will know clearly what you're going to play and he can strategize this policy. Okay. So maybe it's okay if you do not appreciate this fully here, but I just wanted to mention that so that when we do the full RL setting, you'll understand that clearly. Okay, so that was one of the motivation. Like this will allow us to handle stochastic policies. Okay, so let's consider a scenario where we have let's say four arms. Just for the example, let's say a one, a two, a three, a four. So one, uh, we are trying to look at a stochastic policy. So our policy will 
is like a mapping from or action to with what probability you should take that action. Okay. So it's like probability of A1. What is the probability with which I should play arm A1? Maybe you call it some, let's say, theta A1. And let's say uh, A. So let's say there are only four actions. Then this should be what? Right? If you think like policy is like a mapping from the action to with what probability you should take that action. Okay. So if this is our uh, policy, then what is our task here? What do we mean by finding the best policy? We should find the best. Every set of theta vector will give us a policy, right? So if I keep theta a1 equal to like half, 1 by 4, 1 by 4, or 0 maybe, right? So it's like every set of theta is corresponds to one set of policies, right? Every vector theta, if I call theta as uh, this vector, this set, So every every theta will give me one particular policy. Now my task is to find the best possible theta under some definition of what we should define. What we should define we should define what is the best policy under whatever definition we give as the best policy. Uh, you should find the best theta. Okay. So you can think think of it as a parameterized representation of a policy. Like the policy is being represented through some parameters theta. Okay, this is called uh, parameterized representation. So we can call a policy as a function of an action which is parameterized by theta. So this is the notation I'll use. It's a function of an action uh, after semicolon is whatever I keep that is like a parameter of that function, right? So now we have to first define uh, what uh, what is a good policy, right? Then we can try to find the best policy, okay? So if I define such a policy, let's say this is a policy I tell you. If I want to understand what is, how good is this policy, then how can I evaluate? So in the bandit setting, I'll tell, okay, this is a policy which I'm going to follow. In every time slot, I'm just going to uh, uh, maybe... Uh, toss a four-faced die where the, each face has these probabilities. So if it lands in phase uh, one, I'll, I'll take action one. If it lands in phase two, I'll take action two. So this is the policy I'm going to follow under some banded problem. So if I want to uh, understand how good is this policy, what will be a metric? Yeah, so this is a policy. What is the expected reward I'll get for this policy? That will give us a measure of how good is this policy, right? So, no, these are not function of time. So, as I was telling, uh, if uh, if you want to play a particular policy, then if you know the true means, then the particular policy is play the best term with probability one or other. Like play the best term. So, in that setting, if uh, if you are after learning everything, what is that you want to stick to finally? That's what we are talking about. You do whatever learning you want. You do whatever exploration you want. Finally, what policy you should follow after all the exploration is done. Okay. So if after you, you are given a lot of time, you can do whatever exploration you want. Finally, what do you want to do is what I'm asking here. If that is the case for a deterministic policy, you would have just uh, did whatever exploration you want and then told I'll play down with the true, highest true mean. Similarly, if this is a policy, then what is a performance? Every time slot, I'm doing this. Okay. So then the performance of the policy. Can be defined as the expected reward that you get for playing this policy. So let me call this Nita. Is like, uh, what is the expected reward for get for playing this policy? 
so there are a lot of actions possible and what is the probability that i play polis action a is pi of a and what is the expected reward that i'll get whenever i play policy a uh, whenever i play arm a mu of a right correct so this is a good uh, metric for our policy right it tells how good is your policy if you keep all the probability on uh, best expected reward possible expected. if let's say arm a1 has the highest true mean then my pi of my theta a1 can be 1 everything else can be 0 correct so then this is a meaningful way of uh, estimating how good is your policy which is nothing but uh, expected reward per uh, policy pi And this policy is a parameterized policy, right? So now I can write this uh, function as a neta as a function of theta, right? So it's like, uh, because my policy is a function of theta, I can write it like this, pi of, it's a function of theta. Now what is my task? You have a function, you want to maximize the expected reward, right? So you have a, some function of theta, you just maximize this as a function of theta, right? With the constraint that uh, it should be a valid policy, that's all, right? The theta should be like it. Like these thetas can be between zero and one, right? So, but what is one issue we'll face if we try to optimize this function? Do we know mu of a? We don't know mu of a, right? So that is a limitation for us. If we know mu of a as some function of a, let's say, then we know we can just do a simple uh, maximization for this problem, then we'll get the best policy. But what is it we don't know? We don't know mu of a. But what, what can we do? We don't know mu of a, but uh, what is allowed? Like what, what can we do? We can sample arms, that much we know. We know how to find estimates of mu of a, but we don't know mu of a. So if our if our update rule has some estimates of mu of a, we can do something. Uh, right now our update, our function is requiring us to find, use mu of a, which we do not know. So we'll try to do something so that uh, we'll somehow be able to use mu of a like estimates of mu of a's and minimize this function, okay? We will not explicitly compute mu of a's estimate, but we will be able to get rewards, right? Whatever you do, you will get a sample reward in every time slot. So we will try to use those sample rewards to maximize this function, okay, in some heuristic way. So if, uh, let's say you know this mu of a, what are some methods that you know to maximize such a function? If you are given some function and you are asked to maximize that uh, function, is, do you know any simple techniques? Like those who are done machine learning course, uh, do you know some techniques which can be used for solving some or minimizing some loss function or gradient descent, right? So how many of you do not know gradient descent? Can you raise your hands? Okay, so I'll try to quickly give you a brief of what gradient descent means and then I'll try to use it, okay? So very quick intro to gradient descent. Let's say I have a function like this. If I want to minimize this function over uh, h comma y, what is the value? If I want to minimize such a function, what will be what will be the value? What is the minimum that this function can take? Zero, right? At h uh, star equal to right. We know this, but uh, 
uh, this is very intuitive to understand but if you want to do this in a systematic way what you can do is you do not know what is the optimal h star and y star let's say you start with some h not y not which is some arbitrary point in your euclidean plane you start with some arbitrary point and what you can do is uh, you can update your you can find a new uh, so this is your approximate point which is started which is not actually the minimum of that function you start with that and what you do is you follow this update rule as follows Okay, evaluated it. Uh, so, you just calculate the gradient of that function at uh, at equal at your current point. Okay, you just calculate your gradient at your current point and you just move in the direction. Let's say you have some function like this. Let's say you are starting at this point. The minimum is this point, right? Let's say you start at this point. Now you have to move around to find to reach the minimum, right? So which side we have to move? We have to move right or left if you want to reach the minimum of this point of this curve. We have to move right. But how do we understand from that without seeing the figure? You just look at the slope of this function here. If the slope is uh, negative, you move you move in the right direction. If the slope is positive, you move towards the left direction. If you, if the slope is positive, you move left. If the slope is negative, you move right. So you just move in the opposite direction of your slope, right? So that's what we are doing here. You are just in the two dimension. You are just moving in the negative direction of your gradient so that the function value will decrease. Okay, you keep doing this till uh, h t plus one is equal to h t and y t plus one equal to y t, right? Till your gradient becomes zero. Let's say it's a convex function. It, let's say it has a unique minima. Then uh, the, the gradient will be zero at that point. So you keep you keep doing this till you reach a uh, fixed point, right? Till your update will give you the same value. Okay. So this is what is called a gradient descent algorithm. So everyone is clear with this. So if we had known um, mu of a, then we could have done this easily, because we know the functional form. We'll just take the gradient, and we'll keep using this uh, gradient descent algorithm. But uh, we do not know the mu of a, right? So in such a case. This is called gradient descent. When you do not know the uh, function fully, uh, there is an algorithm called stochastic gradient descent, which we can potentially use. Okay, if you do, you cannot compute the gradient exactly, but you can compute something which is uh, approximately equal to your gradient in some particular sense. Then you can use an algorithm called stochastic gradient descent. What this tells is here you can think of it like this, right? If I call this as h bar, this whole thing is h bar. H d bar equal to h d h bar t minus one minus alpha into. This is our gradient descent, right? This is the gradient descent update rule. Now in stochastic gradient descent, what we'll do is uh, we'll just uh, write everything else same, but instead of uh, gradient, we'll just use some other function of our current uh, point. What this what this should satisfy is you, you this g may not be equal to your gradient, but it should satisfy this property. If you take the expected value of this gradient of this g that should be equal to your gradient such that expected value of
okay so this is called stochastic gradient descent if you can't find the gradient exactly but if you can find some function which is equal to the gradient in expectation okay so this is like a noisy gradient like we don't know the true means of our uh, arms but we can find a mu bar of mu bar of a whose expectation is equal to mu of a right mu bar of a is a random variable right because it depends on the random samples that we get but the expected value of mu bar of a is equal to mu of a right No, you'll know that before that, I'm just giving you what gradient descent is and what stochastic gradient descent is. We'll go to that. Yeah, so if you know the, if you know the function and you can calculate the gradient, if we cannot do that, huh? whatever you want to maximize, if you know neta of, if you know neta of theta, then you can use gradient descent. If you do not know neta of theta, or if you cannot, what is the problem? We cannot compute the gradient. That is the only problem, right? Here, if you want to use this gradient descent, you cannot compute the LF because we don't know F. We don't know mu of theta in our neta of theta, right? So we, but if you can't compute the gradient, it's fine. If you can compute some other function whose expected value is equal to the gradient, then also you can use an algorithm called uh, stochastic gradient descent. Now we'll see how we can use this in our problem. Yeah, in this problem, as I said, it's a trivial problem in the bandit setting. I'm telling this as a motivation for you to use it in the full RL setting because there will be a lot more complications there. If you understand the core ideas here, it will be easy for you to appreciate that later. Okay. G is a, a noisy gradient. You can think of it like the gradient plus some noise whose no, expected noise is equal to be like something like this. Right? It's similar to, like you don't have exact value, but you are calculating a random value based on some random samples which you get. But the expected value of the function should be equal to your gradient. So you can think of it as gradient plus some noise, which is a noise random variable, and the expected value of that noise is zero. You can think like that. Yes. Any doubts at this point? Everyone is fine with gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent? Okay. So now let's go back to our neta of theta. So if uh, this is our uh, mu of a, ideally we'd want this thing, right, to calculate uh, for every, we want to have know the partial derivative of uh, the neta with respect to every parameter, right? This is what we ideally want. So this is equal to what? Mu of a is not dependent on theta, right? Mu of a is some constant, which is not dependent on our policy. And only the this part will be dependent on theta. So now mainly, what is the issue? If we know mu of a, then we know this. But we don't know mu of a. So we want uh, to find, this is the actual function which we want to use in the, in the gradient descent. We don't know this. Now we have to somehow, we have to do something so that we'll come up with a G. We will come up with a uh, whose expectation will be equal to this. Okay. We have to come up with the G whose expectation will be equal to this. So let's see how we can uh, get there. Okay. So I'll use some uh, this standard uh, trick from uh, differentiation, which is like
like you know right log differentiation is like one by its uh, that means this is true right for any function it's so we'll just try to use this in our uh, problem now If you try to use this, what will we get? We have dou f by dou x, right? Dou, dou pi by dou theta i. There, I'll just replace this with this. What will I get if I do that? It will be equal to dou log pi of a theta by dou theta i into what should I multiply? Into pi of a theta, okay? So, I don't want uh, mu of a, but I can handle uh, um, expected mu of a. So we are trying to go to expected mu of a, okay? as a function of our policy, right? So this can be written as what? Can we write this as an expectation? With respect to our policy pi. So what will it be equal to? Expectation with respect to our policy pi. What should I write inside this? Like this is, Expectation is of this term, right? Expected any f of x equal to f of x is to the property of that, right? So I can write like this, right? Mu of a into right. Expectation similar to this. This is like an expectation of respect to pi. You can write it like this, right? Because a is a function of pi. So a is uh, a is being sampled randomly according to a distribution pi. So you can write it as expected mu of a when you play a according to pi. Correct? This is fine, right? Because a started random pi. So similarly, I can write it like this, right? And what is mu of a? That is expected reward for playing arm a, right? So it's a function of our environment, right? So I can write it like this, expected v is my environment, let's say. Expected V R T given A T equal to A. Can I write it like that? Mu of A. The expected reward that you get for playing Ame. Correct? Into do log pi of A theta given do theta. Fine. Because mu of a is nothing but expected reward for playing ame. That's what we wrote it as. Then what I can do is uh, I can just write it like this.
if at is the arm that i'm playing at time t which is being sampled according to policy pi and rt is the reward that i got for playing the arm at i can write it like this where the policy the Correct. Tangent of the policy axis is going to take. Right. So this is equal to our uh, gradient. So if, when we started with uh, the stochastic gradient, what is that we wanted? We don't know how to compute the gradient, but we wanted some other g whose expectation is equal to our gradient. Did we get that? We got some g whose expected value is equal to your gradient. And do we know how to find, do we, we can get g, right? g is what? You, this function, we know. Here, we are having some parameterized policy. We know what pi as a function of theta. We don't know the best theta, but we know for a given theta what pi is. Correct? So then we can easily differentiate pi with respect to theta because we know the form of pi of theta. Right? For example, if this was my theta, if this was my uh, parameterized policy, I can differentiate my uh, policy with respect to theta because that form I know. I don't know the best theta, but I know for a given theta what pi is. That I can calculate. And RT is nothing but a sample reward. I know how to get sample rewards, right? I can play whatever arm I want. I can get a sample reward from that arm. So I know how to compute the in inner part of this expectation. That means I can use stochastic gradient descent, right? Because I don't know the gradient, but I know some other G whose expected value is equal to my gradient, right? So my, uh, so a sample, Estimate of my gradient is uh, this. The sample estimate of my gradient is this following, which is okay. I don't know the gradient, but I know how to calculate a sample of the gradient whose expectation is equal to the actual gradient. So now, what will be my policy gradient uh, algorithm? Like, what is that we are interested in? We are interested in finding the best theta, right? We wanted to maximize neat of theta. And for that, we had to use gradient descent. We don't know the gradient, so we computed a stochastic gradient version. So now, what will be my algorithm? You don't know the best thetas, so you start with some arbitrary thetas. Okay, so the first step is initialize. Uh, let's call it theta naught, which is at time zero. Uh, what is my theta? I'll just start with some arbitrary thetas. Just like how, if you want to minimize this function, you don't know what is the best h comma y. You start with whatever h comma y you want, but you just go according to these slopes. Wherever you start, if you follow the slopes and move in the right direction, you'll reach the minimum. If there is a a unique minimum like this and if you have a nice curve like this. So I'll start with some initialize uh, theta. Arbitrarily. Okay. Then at time t, what should I do? So if you know theta, that means you know what policy you want to play, right? Because your policy is a function of theta. So you have some current uh, theta estimate, what you think is the best uh, thetas, right? So if you know the thetas, you know the policy, right? Because theta is a function of your policy. So if you know the policy, what you have to do? You have to just sample one arm according to your policy. So just sample an arm according to Pi t, okay. Sample arm a t according to distribution 
pi of a theta t theta t minus 1 na? correct you just sample one arm according to your current theta estimate fine so this this might not be the best theta, but if we are starting with some theta. We will improve the theta. Okay. Then what will we get? You just sample the sum and play the term. Then observe the sample reward for arm AT. Observe sample reward RT obtained from Arm AT. Okay. So just sample your arm according to your current theta estimate uh, and just play that arm. You'll get some reward RT. You just sample that reward. Now we can use stochastic gradient descent, right? What is stochastic gradient descent? Theta T plus 1 or theta theta T equal to what? Theta t minus one. Theta t minus one plus. Previously we are minimizing, so we are using minus alpha into something. Here we are maximizing, so we'll use plus alpha. We'll just move it along the direction of the slope because we want to maximize. It will be into some some small constant alpha. It can be a function of time also. It can be either some small uh, value or it can have some. It can also be chosen as a function of time. There are some values which are allowed for the stochastic gradient descent to converge to the right uh, uh, minimum. For example, this alpha is telling, this gradient is telling uh, in which direction you how much you have to move in that direction. So if you are here, you know that you have to move right. But what if you move to the left? Again, if I move too much left, I'll come here. So I'll oscillate, right? So you have to choose alpha carefully. You have to choose alpha such that initially maybe you can do a little uh, bigger steps because let's say you are very far. If you go very slowly, maybe it will take a lot of time for you to come towards the minimum. So initially, maybe you can take uh, larger steps. But after some time, when you are getting closer and closer to the minimum, let's say you are here, then you have to make smaller and smaller steps, right? If you are here, then you can just jump to here. But if you're here, if you that much, you will come here. So, as time increases, you can decrease your alphas. If you decrease appropriately, you will uh, convergence to the minimum is guaranteed. So, there is a uh, rich theory on how to choose alpha t's. Like, for example, 1 by, uh, I think 1 by t is a good uh, choice for alpha t. So, you can choose your alpha. And what is our estimate of the gradient? What is our g of Hence, which is RT into do RT into del of this, right? Correct. This was my G which I calculated, whose expectation is equal to the gradient. So I'll just keep doing this. Eventually, I'll go to the optimal policy. Because we are trying to maximize neta of theta. If you choose the alpha t appropriately, like let's say 1 by t or something, so you'll eventually reach the best policy or best thetas. Okay. So this is called a policy gradient algorithm where you are updating your policy based on the uh, stochastic gradient descent. So uh, did you realize that we are not explicitly computing the value of each action? So at any given point, we are not explicitly understanding what is mu of A bar for every arm. But we are, of course, you have to look at the samples of the rewards to do anything. 
we are using that but we are directly trying to understand what is a good policy we are not saying first i'll know what is the true mean for every arm and then based on that i'll decide what is a good policy we are directly learning what is a good policy by playing the arms according to some particular rule so it uh, of course we will be in uh, interested in like you might be curious about what is a regret uh, that this algorithm can guarantee because at every time you are playing some action according to some rule so every time there is some possibility of playing the bad arm because it's stochastic policy initially your policy might be very random and as time progresses maybe your policy concentrates around the best arm more so so analyzing the regret is a little more involved for these examples although i would have loved to do the regret proof for this but uh, i wanted to move on from bandits and start the full rl setting so i'm not going to prove the regret analysis for this but uh, this regret analysis has not been uh, known for a long time only in around 2020s uh the regret of these kind of algorithms are being uh, derived so if you are interested in research in these kind of algorithms maybe there are a lot of variants of bandit problems we have seen one particular variant of bandit problem called stochastic multi arm bandit so there are multiple variants of bandit problems so you can if you are interested in doing research on this kind of a topic you can look at uh, some variants for example contextual bandit is one variant of a bandit problem so there are a lot of variants and these are these find applications in a lot of real time recommendation systems so that is one example of where bandit will be used for example if you see how google places it ads or how uh, platforms like netflix recommend you which videos to watch so these are very practical uh, these bandits have very practical applications in these kind of a settings so for example one of my friend in sony research was telling he was using contextual bandits for Uh, recommending what uh, videos they should show in Sony Live, right? So there are a lot of practical applications for this, and uh, even theoretical analysis for a lot of variants of the bandit problems, or uh, for algorithms like band uh, policy gradients, regret analysis for these kind of problems are open problems. Like uh, it's been done for the last four five years, so I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, open problems. So if you are interested in uh, working in this, maybe you can look it up. look up those kind of problems so i will not go into the regret uh, details but you roughly understood what is a policy gradient algorithm right so so if you don't have a convexity it will go to some local minimum it won't go to the global minimum like all the neural networks are working like that right you are using stochastic gradient descent but you don't know whether the loss function is convex or not you will just use it uh, assuming that you'll go to some local minimum which is a reasonable approximate for your global minimum right so this is for any parameterized policy i can do this like how i choose my pi of theta is up to me right my pi of theta generally uh, one uh, depending on your pi of theta you'll get the exact update rule because the gradient depends on the form of pi of theta right so one popular pi of theta which is used is uh, this thing let's say your uh, parameters of uh, you for each arm let's say you have a parameter which is like theta of a let's say you have a finite number of arms let's say if you have continuous set of arms you can use maybe a uh, some continuous function of theta for your pi okay so one example of pi is the following one example parameterization for pi is let's say your theta is this you just do a soft match so over this which is like uh, you play you can think of theta of a as a preference that you are giving for that particular arm you can think of uh, pi as if theta is high you want to play that arm more so you can think of it as Yes, this is called a soft match uh, function hmm. so it's just a normalization constant whatever i wrote in the bottom so i just play uh, arm a proportional to e power theta okay 
okay in the bottom the denominator is just to make it a probability distribution okay so that the sum of all uh, the arms probability should be one okay so one exercise would be to if assume that the rewards are bernoulli rewards and you take this as your policy parameterization and find the update rule exactly that is just find del log a theta okay so if for any given parameterization i should find uh, that derivative right to find the update rule so one exercise that you can take is you think the arms are bernoulli arms and you take this as your parameterization for your policy and derive the exact update rule for your uh, policy gradient okay this is the del del log theta del log pi of theta you need not derive the theta the theta will be given by the stochastic gradient descent you have to just find the uh, del log pi so that you know how to update your theta okay fine uh, so as i said uh, this is useful in uh, continuous action spaces and this is also useful when there is no uh, if the best policy is not a deterministic policy that is one use case and uh, one more thing uh, you can see is like if you understood the stochastic gradient descent properly what is that we wanted we wanted the uh, we wanted a g whose expectation is equal to our gradient so this is one such g or can you get a uh, better g in the sense that Uh, some other g whose uh, fill whose expectation is equal to your gradient but maybe a slightly more robust sample right for example if i have a uh, let's say my gradient is some uh, del then del plus normal gaussian of 0,1 is also a uh, if i add a gaussian noise to the my gradient then that is also a valid g right if i add if this is if i add uh, uh if this is my del if this is my gradient if i just add this with some normal let's say f dash of its let's say f dash of its plus mean zero variance one this can be a valid g right because the expectation of this is this expectation is zero so then this will be equal to my f dash right uh but uh, uh, can you give me better G compared to this, because the more noisy your uh, uh, estimate of the gradient is, intuitively it uh, will take longer time or the performance will be poorer, right? Because if you can find a better and better estimate of the gradient, your algorithm may converge quickly, right? So, for example, if I have zero one, if I have zero half. Or don't you think that will be a better estimate of your gradient? Instead of having normal zero one, if you have normal zero comma half, or normal zero comma point one, don't you think that will have a better uh, that will be a better estimate for your f dash? No, I I'm not telling you can add whatever noise you want, but uh, in this setting. Uh, What are you? This is your. This is your. So if you look at this derivation, ah, uh, can you think of a better G? Is what I'm asking. Just a minor modification based on whatever knowledge you have, based on uh, other algorithms till now. So instead of using arm, this one can be done by arm. Um, if I use Mu bar of a t there, mu bar of a t there. Instead of using r t, mu bar of a t is a better, better. This is mu bar. R t is an equal to this. That is true. But expected mu bar of a t is also equal to mu of a, right? 
yeah that is true but let's say there is a situation where you can uh, for example for the bandits it's very easy to calculate mu bar of 80 right you just you might have played the arm so many times you just take the sample average right so if there is a possibility of uh, evaluating or estimating mu bar of 80 instead of hard mu bar of 80 is even better as well right everyone uh, uh, understood that intuitively because all that you want so but expected mu bar of 80 is also equal to expected is also equal to mu of 80 right so instead of just relying on one sample you just use a lot of samples and use that there so uh, this algorithm this which is a small variant of this uh, this particular algorithm is called actor critic algorithm in the sense that you are using both policy and value based approaches you are using value based approach because you are keeping track of what is mu bar of 80 right you keep mu bar of 80 and then you mu bar of 80 then instead of using rt okay so that means you are doing both value based method and policy based method, some hybrid version of both these algorithm both these methods right because estimating mu bar of 80 is called value based method because you are estimating the value of each arm and you are doing a policy gradient on top of that so this is uh, called a hybrid algorithm which uses both policy based techniques and value based techniques is it clear uh, which expectation because there is no, that is just an So expecting f of x respect x is not going to be an f of x distribution. Like it is expect for any of So it's just a chain of values. And I understand that's a little bit uh, uh, not uh, in sync, but you understood what I said. Like I can write it like this, right? Expected f of x, where x is sampled according to normal 0, 1. Okay. I can write it like this also, right? Expected f of y, where y is sampled according to normal 0, 1. Both are same. It's just a running variable. Fine. So, any other doubts before we proceed further? So everyone understood what is policy gradient and what is uh, how to use value based methods on top of policy gradient method. Just instead of using RT, you use mu bar of 80. Okay. And that is called uh, actor critic. Uh, we'll see that this is a very popular uh, acronym which is used. Actor is like uh, a policy a function is called an actor because it is telling how to act in a particular time step. Critic is uh, any any function which estimates the value of a particular arm is called a critic because it is trying to tell how good or bad is a particular arm. Mu bar of 80 will tell you how good that arm 80 is, right? So, critic is like evaluating the performance of a particular arm's value. Actor is like uh, giving you what action you should take. So, the policy network, uh, the policy function is called actor. It's just a terminology. You need not worry too much about it. Actor is like policy network. Critic is like uh, the value function. Okay. So, mu bar of 8 you can think of as a uh, critic which is telling you some estimate of your true mean how good an action is and actor is uh, what is a good action to take that is what the actor is telling so if you use mu bar of 80 instead of rt then that algorithm is referred to as actor critic algorithm because you are using both an actor and a critic critic is estimating mu bar of 80 actor is telling estimating the best theta to use okay so 
it's fine if you don't appreciate this fully but just uh, i wanted to tell you this terminology so that uh, we'll revisit this again maybe towards the end of uh, the lecture series maybe towards the end of this course because again just like how we have seen value based methods first for the bandit setting we look at value based methods for the full uh, rl problem uh, like some uh, value based methods uh, which are uh, some just throwing some terms at you like there is an algorithm called q learning which is a value based method for the full rl setting uh, similarly there is a policy gradient algorithm uh, for the full rl setting and there will be an active critic algorithm for the full rl setting and uh, for example an algorithm called ppo which is like policy proximal optimization is an active critic algorithm and there will be some things like a to c a3 c you will see lot of things like active critic is called ac advantage actor critic is called a to c asynchronous advantage actor critic is called a to c you will encounter some terms like this but roughly that all these things are uh, policy gradient algorithms where instead of using rt you are using uh, mu of eight, mu bar of 80 at a high level that is what actor critic means uh, towards the in the full rl setting we will read more about this uh, algorithm okay so this is about the policy gradients so now i'll quickly introduce what is called contextual bandits so like uh, let's say uh, let's think of uh, applying bandits to some problem like let's say news news article recommendation system so let's say uh, there are a lot of users who are coming to your website and for every user let's say you have some uh, uh, 10 news articles with you for every user you have to show one of the news articles to the user and whether the user likes that or clicks that user article which you show or not is the reward that you get if you show some particular article if the user clicks that article you get a reward of 1 let's say if the user does not click that article let's say you get a reward of 0 you model it as a bernoulli arm and the arms are your articles let's say you have some 10 articles now uh, every user might not uh, uh, have the same uh, liking for every article right some users might like some kind of articles some other user might like a different kind of articles so uh, every user cannot be treated similarly right so here there are some 10 norms which are like 10 news articles for you but uh, uh, the state is the user here every user is like a state so for a particular user the best term might change so for a given state what is the best term so it's like one step above the bandit problem it's like in the bandit we have only one state here we are having multiple states if you are in a particular state what is the best action to take in that state so here you can think of state as the user and the best term as the best news article for that particular user understood so you can think of the state as some particular feature representation of a user like for every user maybe there will be some uh, features associated with the user which will tell something about the user maybe the age of the user or <coughs> the country of the user or the gender or the qualification or whatever some uh, features which the browser will capture from you so you have some particular features uh, when a user visits a website it will have some particular information about that user some features like age gender location what kind of a browser you are using you are using from android or you are browsing from a website desktop some features you can collect like this and based on that you want to decide which is the best term for that particular user so one way to deal with it is uh, treat each user as a separate bandit problem okay so every user you treat as a separate bandit problem so if you treat as a separate bandit problem whenever that user comes the state will be the same because the state is decided by the user so if you fit a user then your state is fixed that means if say it boils down to a normal bandit problem right so if you play with that user for a lot of time then you can find the best term for that particular user right then uh, let's say another user comes you also play uh, with that user for a lot of time then you will know what is the best term for that user 
you treat each user as a separate bandwidth problem, as a separate one state bandwidth problem, and you solve it. That is one way of dealing with it. The other way is, but uh, each user will not let you explore with him for a lot of time, right? A user will come and you have to show some article and he will leave. He might not even come again, right? So you cannot treat each user as a separate bandit problem ideally and learn, uh, explore with him and then exploit him later. This is not possible. So what you have to do is, you have to learn some uh, 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 representation, okay? For this kind of a user, this is a best term. For these kind of a user, this is a best term. You have to learn such meta characteristics. You cannot say for this particular user, this is the best term. I cannot uh, have the flexibility to do, I will not have the flexibility to do so. So maybe every user has a feature. Okay, if the feature is closer to these values, maybe this is a good uh, arm for this guy. If the feature is closer to this arm, this is a good arm. So here, the supervised and unsupervised learning techniques will come into picture. This is like RL plus supervised learning or RL plus unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning is what? If, if you remember uh, at a high level, what is unsupervised learning? Clustering is one way of unsupervised learning, right? So clustering problem is one unsupervised learning. So one way you can do is you just uh, cluster all the user features into some different clusters. You have a lot of users. There are a lot of possibilities for the features. You cluster them into some groups and treat each group as one particular bandit problem, one state bandit problem, right? You cluster all the user features and for every cluster, you solve a separate bandit problem. Then it's like you are first doing an unsupervised learning on the user features. Then you are learning, okay, what is the best term for this set of group, group of users. That is how you can use unsupervised learning on top of RL. The other way is, we can even use supervised learning. So the supervised learning is, you think of uh, users as some features. For every feature, uh, the true mean or the best, uh, for every user, the uh, true mean of every article will change, right? For a particular user, the true means could, the, the probability that he like the article one will be something, the probability that he like article two will be something. So the true mean is like the probability of the article liking, right? Here, because it's a Bernoulli random variable, the true mean is nothing but the probability that the user will like that uh, article. So for every user, there'll be a different probability that he'll like the article. So you can model the best mean, and the true mean of each term, instead of modeling it as a real number, you model it as a function of user features. So every user has some features u, maybe the u is like say a three-dimensional vector, h1, h2, it's three. So let's say every user has some feature vector like this. Every user has some uh, feature vector like this. And given these feature vectors, there'll be different true means for every arm. Because given the user features, like this particular user will like arm one with some probability, arm two with some probability. So instead of treating it as a function of u, you treat it as a function of this feature vector. So my true mean of arm A will be mu A of HCU. So previously the true mean of arm A is mu A. Now it's not a real number for us. The true mean of arm A is a function of both the arm and the user feature, which is a context. That's why it's called contextual bandwidth. So this is the true mean of uh, a particular user x. Now we have to just model this function using some approximation. So maybe you can just think of as new way of hu equal to uh, some, let's say w1 h1 plus w2 h2 plus So just model it as a linear function. Maybe if these are the features of my user, then the true mean like a function of user will be like this. This is also a function of uh, your arm also. You have to just be careful. So for every arm, uh, there will be a function of x, which is the function of your true mean. The true mean of every arm is a function of x. So every arm has such function. 
which is a function of your user features now you have to solve uh you have to just learn w1 w2 and w3 using some data so whenever user one whenever some particular user comes yeah whenever user Not of and you randomly choose a particular answer. Then you get one sampling of this through mean. Right? Then it will be like a labeled data, like a regression problem, where this is the user features and this is the whether he liked it or not. This is the user features. This user came, I showed this arm. And whether he liked it or not, you just note down this data. Let's say you are doing exploration first. So every user is coming. You are randomly showing one arm, and you are just noting down whether that particular user liked that arm or not. So if you remember in the first class, we have written ST, AT, RT. We have written like this, right? So this is the user picture, and what arm you have showed me, and whether he liked it or not. We just collect this data. Okay, then. You look at all the data corresponding to some particular arm A. So you look like you get a lot of data. You just look at all the data corresponding to arm A. Then you will have some HY labeling, right? These are the features. Like whenever you just look at all the times in which arm A is played, then just look at all the features of the users and whether he liked it or not. So you'll have a uh, HY labels like HC is the features, whether that user liked that arm or not. So for every arm, you have a table like that. So for what all users you have showed that arm and whether they like that or not. For every arm, you'll have a table like that. For arm A, you'll have a table which all users have showed this arm, whether he liked it or not. So you have some data. You just use the data. So you just use the data to estimate W1, W2, W3 for that particular arm. For arm two, you'll have some date table. You just estimate W1, W2, W3 for that particular arm. So for every arm, you have a weights. So you learn the weights of that particular arm based on the data for that particular arm. So for every arm, you'd have showed to some users. You just note down, okay, for what all users have showed this arm, whether they liked it or not. Just use the data to find mu of A, H. And after some exploration, you will roughly know what is mu A of H. You know this function. Then when a new user comes, you just, uh, for, for that user, you calculate uh, mu A of X for every A, whichever A has the best uh, mu, you just show that A. This is like a greedy algorithm. You can do epsilon greedy, UCB, all these things, but let's say a greedy algorithm, you somehow do some exploration and learn mu of the, mu A of X. And when a new user comes, you know the features of that user, just find mu a of x for every arm for that user, then you'll know what is the best arm according to your exploration. Play the arm, uh, that is a greedy algorithm. Play the arm with probability one minus epsilon. With epsilon, play some other random arm. This is like epsilon greedy. You can come up with all variants of algorithms we have discussed till now. So this is roughly the contextual bandits. So uh, from uh, next class, uh, we'll go into the full RL setting. So this is an intermediate setting where you have bandit problem, then a multi-state bandit problem, then in the full RLG. Okay, thank you.